This might be controversial, but saying this bike is too big for you is probably one of the biggest lies in motorcycling. If you can't sit flat foot, then it's too big for you. So that's the first lie. It may come from a well-meaning place, but people have lost sight of the origin and think that it applies to the rest of their riding career. And anyone who's ever ridden dirt, track, adventure bikes, and even baggers can tell you that this doesn't really apply past your first starting out on a bike. The idea first comes from introductory courses, specifically in the US at MSF. Not everybody has a height issue with some bikes, so to just keep the course general, they don't put short rider tricks into their curriculum. So instead, they just make sure that all new riders are on a bike that's low enough that they don't have to tiptoe. That's why they put me on a Honda Grom on my first day. But in a lot of other countries, like in the UK and the Netherlands, putting both feet down in the introductory course will actually fail you. No, God, please, no! You're required to put one foot down, specifically the left foot and your right foot has to be on the brake anytime you stop. And about this not applying for other types of riding. When you do any off-roading, like on dirt bikes or adventure bikes, that bike needs to be taller to prevent the clearance. I am 5, 3.75 inches tall, 31 inch inseam crush the floor. My feet are flat on the ground on the Honda Dirt Bike 125cc, but that's actually made for children. And I can even feel my back hurting after just about 30 minutes of riding on that bike. So I'm much more comfortable on the taller one, the 230F. And I'm also tiptoe. A lot of dirt riders find themselves in that position, so a lot of dirt riders already know how to handle taller bikes. One foot down. That's it. And maybe a little butt scooch if it's extra tall for you. Some may have some even extra tricks if their feet can't touch the ground at all, but that's not what we're gonna address in this video. And as far as ruining the geometry of the bike, if you've ever heard that saying, this especially applies for track days. If you ever wanna do a track day, a lot of organizations don't allow lowered bikes past the novice stage. Once you hit intermediate, you have to be on a stock height bike because that bike was designed to be able to lean and not have any serious damage. And the same thing applies for going over obstacles off-road, whether you're going over logs or rocks or cars, off-roading bikes are designed with that clearance in mind. And if you've ever heard that saying, hashtag tiptoe game, some people have gotten used to just tiptoeing their bikes. Personally, for me, I'm really unstable tiptoeing bikes and I have found that I drop my bike a lot doing that. One foot down is actually so much more stable for me and I really reduced the dropping of my bike. But the longer I've been riding, the more I've gotten used to just balancing a bike and those drops at stops have gotten few and far between the longer I've been riding. And this whole one foot down I keep talking about, I actually learned that from Jocelyn Snow. She's five one and a half and is a BMW off-roading instructor. She rides a GS1250 and her feet don't even touch the ground on that bike. So she has a lot of techniques, not just if you're tiptoeing, if you literally can't touch the ground on your bike. And you can see that on her YouTube channel or you can even train with her in California. I have a video showing that training right over here and another one on my bike a year later right over here. Managing a larger bike can seem really intimidating and daunting and counterintuitive. Who would think when you're standing on a bike for the first time in your life to only use one foot? It would feel more stable to use both, right? But the tricks are actually really easy as long as you know what they are. Some people don't even know that they exist and don't bother looking them up and just go straight to either lowering their bike or sticking with the bike they really don't love, they're just flat footing on it. That was me at one point. I almost quit riding because I really wanted to ride more bikes, a wide variety of bikes. Granted, if I didn't have a YouTube channel, I probably would have been fine just commuting on my Suzuki S40 Boulevard. But because I was going to these press events where I could ride all kinds of bikes, and I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of other YouTubers. I really wanted to get good at this. And come to find out, it's way easier than you think. Like you could learn these tricks in any one of my short rider tricks videos in five minutes, practice it for the next half hour, and you're probably pretty much done. Train insane or remain the same. Shout out to people like Jocelyn Snow and Jerry Palladino who show short rider tips 
on tall bikes or wide baggers. And I've been going down that big bike rabbit hole ever since. Since I started riding seven years ago, I've put tens of thousands of miles on road trips, crossing the country, doing police and GS trophy drills, all on bikes that people in the comment section said were too big for me. And I've repeatedly gone against this next lie with just about every bike I've ridden, except maybe a few. If you can't pick it up, it's too big for you. Mm, I disagree. That's the second lie. That some people say that you shouldn't even be riding that bike if you can't pick it up. What those people are forgetting, because they're obviously slackers, is that sometimes you don't have the right technique yet for that bike. And sometimes it just takes a few little tweaks, moving your butt a little bit lower, moving your hand a different place, moving your feet a different place. Some people want to put a bike on the ground and before they even buy it, see if they can lift it. And if they can't, they say, well, it's not for me. It's not that simple. I've literally tried lifting my bike improperly, had an instructor show me how to do it, and all of a sudden I could lift it. And the thing about technique is that sometimes it takes practice to get your muscle memory to make sure you're doing it properly. And lifting a bike, at least from behind, that in a way is a hack squat. And maybe that's a way you've never exercised before. Maybe that's just a way you need to develop muscles in those places. When I first got my bike, I did 3,000 U-turns on it, and then I rode it across the country, and I didn't know how to pick it up yet. And I did drop it a few times, but every time I did, other people came by and helped me pick it up. It was always in a public, uneven ground place like a gas station. The biggest risk there was dropping it in the middle of the US, in some of the desolate stretches when no one was around. So I just made it a point that anytime I stopped on my bike to keep an eye on where the ground was and where I was putting my feet down. So that, be that was a little more risky at gas stations where ground would be uneven or slippery, but there were always people there. With as long as I've been riding, I've never been stranded with a bike on the ground and no one around to help pick it up. It wasn't until I got home that I applied the techniques I learned from Jocelyn. And it's not so much strength as it is the leverage, it's technique, technique, technique. On how to properly lift my bike. And I was also well aware that I had never been really consistent in a workout routine. And I also had this condition where pretty much my whole life, I didn't really have an appetite. I was literally prescribed a medicine by a doctor to increase my appetite so that I would eat more. I really wasn't eating enough for my age and height, which made me kind of a weakling. I never really had a reason to do anything about it until I got my dream bike. And I decided to mind what I ate, watch my calories, watch my protein intake, and start working out to increase muscle. And it wasn't long before lifting my bike became really easy. That was like nothing. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. And sure, you can just get a smaller bike and what's the big deal with that? But in my case, I love a challenge. I have no problem putting a little extra effort for something that I really want. And when I rode the Triumph Tiger low, I fell in love and I really wanted it. But I noticed that the low version really hurt my knees in a long day of riding. So that's why I went with the taller version and knowing that I w eventually wanted to keep working on off-roading techniques, the taller version was definitely the way to go and that big tank to make it through the long stretches of US highways, and that bigger engine to be able to handle the highway speeds that we have here in US, it was worth it to just put in a little more effort. This lie that people like Stephen Brown and Joe Blow are really saying in between the lines is, I can't do it, so you can't do it. They don't know you. They don't know your goals. They don't know your discipline level. They don't know what you're capable of. Anyone who tells you that you can't do something doesn't know what it's like to be successful, to apply themselves, to be the best at whatever they do because they've never done it themselves. Because they have the mentality of, oh, that's difficult, let me stop. You're the kind of person that whether you're getting really good at a hobby, a sport, a skill, your job, you're not the kind of person to see something difficult that you want and say, never mind, not for me. You're the kind of person that says, let me figure out how to make it happen. Just think if your favorite sports team, our military, or any inventor had that mentality. So many accomplishments, so many of the people that we need 
and we admire wouldn't accomplish what they have accomplished. Don't let the underperformers should on you. And to those few boys watching, notice I didn't say men. Props to those of you men who support those who have the mentality of never giving up. Telling ladies that they shouldn't ride a bike that requires a learning curve? Don't let a little girl threaten your masculinity. That being said, this video isn't an argument for everyone to ride bigger bikes. It's an argument to ride whatever you want. Whether that's a Tiger 900 you can't pick up today, but you can next week, or the Yamaha R3 that's low enough to the ground and can pretty much still hold its own on US highways. Keep in mind that the size of the bike you ride isn't based on your current ability or even your body size. It's based on your needs, your riding style, and what you're willing or not willing to do for it. Trying to navigate through tight, slow-moving traffic like this on a Gixxer 1000 is probably going to get someone run over. That bike is probably too big for that purpose. But trying to ride a Trail 125 on US highways where the speed limit is 80 miles per hour? Now that's a bike that's probably too small for that purpose. Actually, legally it is. It tops out at 55 miles per hour and you can't ride it in many states on the highways. There's really no such thing as a bike that's too big. And it's the only one in existence. I can't mess. Um. Now that we've taken Stephen Brown and Joe Blow's man cards, I mean, it wasn't hard. It was basically just lying on the ground, trampled over. And we've established that it's not your bike, it's not your size, it's your character, and it's what you want. Go watch 10 Things Nobody Tells You About Riding next, right over here.